All right. Well, I'm so glad to be here with you guys, even though I am not quite there in uh, on your territory, but I am coming to you from Michigan in the United States, and I'm so excited that I could join you guys at least this way using some technology. And of course, one of my favorite topics to talk about is fossils. So I'm really excited that we're going to get to talk about fossils for the next hour. I'm going to show you some of the stuff I have. So I think uh, we're, we're ready to get going, right? Let's go. Yeah, uh, uh, share the screen and then uh, we'll, we'll, we'll uh, start with the fossils on it. For many, right. uh, just to let you know, this honor uh, uh, goes also as a part of your class, so that this, which is great. So Richard, are you able to share the screen or not? Yes, I will do that in a moment. I got a couple things here I'm still going to do with the big uh, screen. So I just want to make sure uh, you guys got yourself some of these uh, worksheets that we created for you guys. It's three pages. Uh, you can do them now while we're, we're doing this, or you can, of course, do them afterward if you like, but um, it might, might make it a little easier for following along with your paper. So first of all, you know, fossils, what, what exactly is a fossil? And it's important to understand uh, what a fossil is actually let me um, share my screen here with you guys hold on a second as rich is sharing his screen i just want to remind everybody yeah we would like you to fill your attendance form as well because that way we would be able to tell your teachers if they ask us were you here with us today uh, so we're just posting the links in the chat rooms make sure you fill it up in that way we'll be able to share that with your club directors all right, so hopefully everybody is able to see the um, the screen. Is everybody seeing it pretty yeah, good? Yeah, we can see the screen, Richard, yeah. All right, so first of all, let's understand what a fossil is. The fossil, like it says on the screen, is the remains or impression of an organism preserved in petrified form or as a mold or cast in rock. So two things to keep in mind there. It could be the remains, meaning it's the actual creature that got you know replaced by minerals or the impression so let's say a, a dinosaur footstep you know the foot of the dinosaur is not there anymore but we can see the footstep of the dinosaur so that also qualifies as um, a fossil and it has to be of an organism uh, something that uh, was preserved and like I said it was, could be a mold it could be a cast it could be in rock and um, that is what a fossil is. Now, I'm gonna go back here to my full screen because I want to be able to show you some of my fossils in the fossil collection because as part of the requirements, you're supposed to make a collection of 10 different kinds of fossils and name them and, and all this kind of stuff. But of course, uh, since we're kind of grounded at home, we're gonna just kind of look at my collection. It's kind of like a museum because I have a whole bunch of fossils that I've been collecting over the years. So I'm going to show you several of them here. Um, one of my favorites, and usually a lot of people love this one. Hopefully you guys can see these. So right there, that is a shark's tooth. That is a shark's tooth. And this comes from Australia. Very cool, shark's tooth. Um, I also have, and this is kind of a big piece here, this is petrified wood. And it's kind of cool because you can kind of see it's a rock now, but you can see it's a wood. And if you were to look up closely, you can see the grain and everything. So it's kind of cool. Sometimes you Where can Where did see you find it, Richard? So this one comes from Arizona. Wow. Arizona. Now, some of these I actually found. Some of them I actually purchased. But I think I know for the most part where each of these comes from. Here's a small piece of petrified wood, too, that... You might be able to see the grain in there and some of the, the texture of petrified wood. Then here I have, this is called a gastropod. So this is from the ocean. Looks like a tiny little snail. And it is pretty tiny, but this is a little creature from the ocean, a gastropod. Now this one came from Morocco. Morocco, so gastropod. Gastropod, what else do we have? This one is a dental plate from a stingray. Now, stingrays don't have teeth, they have dental plates. So it's kind of like these plates that they use to kind of crush whatever they're gonna eat because they, they're strong, they can crush like a clam or whatever that they're gonna grab to eat. But they have these little ridges in there, you can kind of see that. This came from 
Morocco as well. Morocco. All right. Then I have um, right here. This is called an echinoid. So you can kind of see it has like a, it's basically a sea urchin. Now the fossil name is an echinoid, but a sea urchin. You can sort of see the, the like it's like a five star shape right there. That's how you tell a nechinoid. So it's got those five little lines right here that help you identify what it is. This came from the United States in Illinois. So that's near uh, right there in Chicago. Um, now here I have a piece of coal. Now a lot of people think coal, that's just a rock. No, actually, coal is not a rock. It's a fossil. This coal used to be wood, tree, or bark, or any kind of part of a tree, but it was compressed under heat and turned into a fossil. And of course, um, this is something that you can burn, and it's one of our fossil fuels, but this coal came from West Virginia, which is also one of the states here in the United States. Then here I have a little brachiopod shell. So this is an ocean creature. You can see that it's in its closed position. But you can see all the little lines there. And it's kind of cool because most of the time when we find these fossils, they're in their closed position, which is an interesting clue for the flood and for creation because normally when these guys die, they open up their two little halves. But in the fossil record, we find them closed, which means they were buried alive rapidly. Poor little guy. Doesn't mean he's in there anymore. Remember, all this was replaced by mineral. So this is a brachiopod. This comes from Kansas, which is another state in the United States. If you, if you were to show a picture of the United States and just point right at the middle, this is where Kansas would be. It's right in the middle. Oh, this one's, a, this one's exciting. You're gonna like this one. This is a piece of dinosaur bone. Yeah. <laughs> It's one of the limbs, because you can see the, the long straight angle. Um, not sure what kind of dinosaur bone it is. I have other pieces where I do know what kind it is, but this one was given to me and it's, it's, a, it's a really nice piece. Um, so this is a dinosaur bone, pretty cool. Now I have a, uh, and oh, by the way, and this comes from Argentina, Argentina, that's in South America, of course. I have another dinosaur fossil to show you guys. You're gonna love this one. I have two actually. I have this one, and I have this little one. It's called coprolite. It's dinosaur poop. <laughs> yeah, that's right, that is a fossil too. Dinosaur poop is a fossil. I have this big one, and I got this little one. It's, uh, it's kind of funny, you know, they, scientists give it a nice fancy name so they don't have to go around in the laboratory saying, hey, excuse me, pass me the dinosaur poop. So they call it coprolite, coprolite. Such a much nicer and fancier name. So coprolite, dinosaur poop. Of course, it's, it's a rock now, right? So it's not, you can't smell it. It's not soft or squishy or anything like that. Um, let's see, I think I have another dinosaur fossil to show you guys. This is one of their teeth. So this is, comes from the Spinosaurus. Spinosaurus is uh, one of the larger ones. Top of the food chain right up there with the T-Rex. Um, apex predator had this big spine across the back. I'm sure a lot of you guys know what I'm talking about. These guys are pretty cool. These, this comes from Morocco, Morocco. The Spinosaurus lived in Morocco. All right, what else do I have in here? I have, this one's kind of cool. So this is called a Petoskey stone. Now Petoskey stone is kind of funny because this comes from Michigan right here where I live. This is our state stone. The funny thing is, this is coral, which is from the ocean, of course, coral. And it's kind of funny because we're like, you know, thousand miles from, from the ocean, but our state stone is a rock that comes from the ocean, coral, which is pretty cool. Um, another thing from the ocean that I have to show you, it might be a little hard to see, but this is a fossil fish. Hopefully you can kind of see it there. You can see his head right there and his spine. So this is a, a, a plate, a plate, the slate, and the fish got trapped in there and crushed and preserved. And it's kind of cool. If you were to have the tiny little detail, you can kind of see the little fins and everything. 
Um, this is a crinoid stem. Hopefully you can kind of see the little lines in there. We're gonna talk about these in a few minutes. This is just a stem. Now this was in the ocean, so this is a marine creature. And this was the stem. It's got these little, little lines in it. It's kind of cool. Oh, you guys are gonna love this one. This one's related to the shark. It is the tooth of a megalodon. The megalodon was a very large shark, extinct, or at least it's believed to be extinct. Wouldn't that be crazy if we found out that there was still some alive? We don't know a whole lot about what's in the ocean, right? Richard, is it me or that tooth is like, a, like your face? Yeah, well, here is oh, here. Oh, 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 this is it. Oh, right, right. Oh, wow. Wow. <laughs> yeah, and the big ones were probably triple in size. But uh, these guys were big. Now, you guys probably have seen a bus before. This was probably about the size of a bus or a big truck, a lorry or something like that. It was huge. And this is one of their smaller teeth. Wow. Kind of glad they're extinct. Like, like the regular ones aren't scary enough. <laughs> um, this is a trilobite. So I actually have one that's left in the rock, in the matrix. So the matrix is the rock that surrounds a fossil. Now, sometimes a fossil is removed from its matrix. Like most of these other ones, it was removed from the rock that it was found in. But right here, you can see that this little trilobite, an arth arthropod, is still in its matrix. It's still surrounded by rock. And it's kind of cool so you can see where, it's, uh, where it comes from. Um, I have a fossil of a plant. Now, so far we've been looking at mostly creatures and stuff like that, but this is a plant. You can see a fern that was fossilized, still in its matrix. And it's not really a fern at this point. It's the impression of the fern because the fern is, you know, leafy and fleshy and those are going to decompose really, really fast. But here, before it decomposed completely, it left an impression of those little fern leaves, which is pretty cool. And I have one more fossil. This is kind of one of my favorite ones. This is an ammonite. So this comes from the ocean. This one's been polished, but you can see that spiral shape. It's kind of cool. Here's the other side of it. It's been polished, so that's all pretty looking. The one you usually find it, and it's been sliced in half so that you can kind of see the inside of it and that's the whole cool thing about collecting these is you can see at the inside they're really pretty replaced by all the minerals and crystals and stuff really cool all right so that is part of my little fossil collection uh, one of the things that i wanted to, to mention to you guys and i'm going to go back to the screen share here in a second that was my show and tell time all right. Did you notice that most of the ones that I described, at least the location, most of those locations were inland, like literally 500, 1,000 miles from any ocean, and most of them were marine creatures as well, which is kind of strange. I'm like, whoa, what's all these marine creatures doing way out there? This is a huge clue for the flood. Because the flood in the Bible tells us that water covered every landmass in the world. So you're looking at the map and, you know, it doesn't matter where you are, that used to be covered with water. You know, I was saying earlier, Kansas, was, which is right in the middle of the United States, used to be covered with water. Here in um, Michigan, which is also way inland, we find lots of fossils of sharks here, whales, walruses. So it's, it's pretty cool that we see these marine fossils literally on every part of the world. Here's a, another great piece of trivia for you guys. Mount Everest, of course, which is the tallest mountain in the world. The top of Mount Everest and the top of most of the, the tallest mountains in the world. You know what we find up there? Marine fossils. Yeah, ocean creatures way up there. Shells and clams and all sorts of marine fossils, which even at the top of the mountain. Now, it doesn't mean that the mountain was up there during the flood because the Bible tells us that the mountains were lifted up. Valleys were formed after the flood. But it's cool to know that even those places up there were at one point way down and underwater. So that's kind of cool. Now, fossils are generally found in sedimentary rock layers. Now, if you've been studying rock layers in school, you know that there are a few different kinds of rock, igneous and metamorphic. Sedimentary basically means 
that it was an accumulation of sand and other particles at the bottom of the ocean and all the weight and everything just crushed it and crushed it and crushed it and turned it into a rock. So it used to be sand and other particles, but then it was crushed and made into rock. And of course, when we find fossils there, it means they were trapped in that sandy ocean bottom and crushed into a fossil, which again is kind of cool because that's going back again to the story of the Bible. That's pretty cool. In order for things to be fossilized, it has to be fast. It has to be quick. This is a huge clue because you can't fossilize stuff slowly. Now, you know, here's this little picture of this cute frog. You know, how to fossilize a frog. Now, if a frog is, you know, cruising around through the jungle or whatever, and all of a sudden it dies, is it gonna be fossilized just automatically? Is it gonna be preserved into this mineral state? No. The only way that can happen is if it is rapidly buried while it's still fresh and preserved, which is a very important clue. You remember seeing a few minutes ago the, the little leafy fern? That's a huge clue right there because a fern is also very soft and very delicate. I mean, if you were to just pluck that off the, the forest floor in like the end of the day, it would be all wilted up and dried up, right? But no, the, the fern that I showed you guys earlier, you can see the leaves were like fresh a moment ago which is a clue that shows us it was rapidly buried. If you can rapidly bury it in the right conditions, then it can be preserved. Because otherwise, that little frog that dies, it's going to decompose. It's going to rot. And that is not how you create a fossil. That's just kind of normal life type stuff. All right. Let us keep going here. All right. So um, got some uh, definitions here that we need to cover. As part of your honor, geology, you've probably all heard of the term geology. Geology is the study of solid materials that make up the earth. So look at what you're standing on. It's dirt, it's rock, it's all this stuff. The people that study that, like the young lady there in the picture, is a geologist. So these are the people that study the rock and all this stuff that's under us, the dirt. And uh, the geologist is the scientist. Uh, Richard, as you, as you were presenting your fossils, uh, uh, quite a few people uh, actually mentioned which are their, uh, their favorite one, and, and, and quite a few agreed with your Polish fossil. They're saying that one is really cool. Isn't maybe for those who are taking part of this uh, honor, maybe you would like to share which fossil um, uh, is your favorite, which we just saw on the screen. Yeah, I would have to say probably the ammonite is, is one of them. Love this guy. It is so pretty, so smooth. I usually have it up and part of my little office decoration because it's so nice. And um, I'd say probably the Spinosaurus tooth is another one of my favorites. Because yeah. it's kind of cool holding this tooth. And, you know, this actually used to be in the mouth of a Spinosaurus. And now it's oh, here in my hand. And it's just kind of cool to think that. Excellent. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. Yeah, sure. So geology, that, uh, that's one that we got to cover. Fossils, you know, we kind of talked about this already. Fossils, of course, are the preserved traces or remains of organisms. It could be trees, leaves, animals, you know, birds, oceans. So anything that was preserved and you generally speaking, converted into a mineral, into rock, not the real thing anymore. Um, catastrophism. So catastrophism is this idea that the earth has been affected by short-lived and violent whoa, events. Sorry, where am I? Here I am. Now, when you're speaking biblically, the flood definitely qualifies as a short-lived and very violent event. And that explains biblically why we see a lot of the stuff that we see today all over the world, canyons and all that kind of stuff. I have a picture there of a um, meteor crater a lot of people think this happened millions and millions and millions of years ago or something, but biblically speaking, this would not be possible because the earth has been organized in layers that the geologists have studied. We know that those layers were formed by the flood, floodwaters. This meteor crater happened after the floodwaters established those layers because you can actually see the layers in the crater. So this happened sometime after the flood. 
but it's kind of cool when you study catastrophism, you look at all these little clues and canyons and things all over the world, you can learn and see that, yeah, a lot of really traumatic things have happened to the world, and this is the name of that study. Paleontology, uh, another one of those ologies, is the study of these ancient life forms that we find in the fossil record. It could be the plants, it could be the dinosaurs, or dinosaur guy would be a paleontologist. And here we have a picture of a guy who's carefully cutting away the, the stone and the rock from around a fossil. So this is a study of learning about all these uh, fossils that are in the rock layers. So if you think about it, the geologist and a paleontologist a little bit different because the geologist is all the stuff under the ground, the rock and all that stuff. But the paleontologist is looking for the ancient life forms that are found in those rock layers, in the fossil record. Then uh, continuing the, the requirements, a graptolite is a marine fossil, so it means it's in the ocean, found in the ocean. And this particular one is one that would live in colonies. So that means they would live in groups and they would cluster together and live in groups. Trilobite, which I showed you one earlier. There's that again, trilobite, an actual one. These are extinct arthropods and I've actually been on a trilobite dig this one here I forgot to mention I found this in Utah that's a state on the western part of the United States very dry and deserty and it's kind of cool because you can go out there and they'll give you a little hammer and a chisel and you can break apart the stone and look for little trilobites and it's kind of cool I went with my family a couple years ago and in about two hours we found about a hundred of them so this is this is one of them and we each have one like in our room, our souvenir of our favorite trilobite that we found, but these are extinct. The reason we believe they're extinct is because they lived along the bottom of the ocean, bottom, you know, floor dwellers. So when the flood came and just mixed everything up, all the mud and everything, these guys did not survive. It was pretty rough down there. So these guys are extinct. They couldn't hide. They couldn't swim up high to where the water may have been clearer. Dinosaur. Of course, you guys know what dinosaurs are. This could be any variety of extinct reptiles. And technically speaking, and, and I know there's a dinosaur honor, which hopefully we'll be able to tackle at a different time. Dinosaurs really are the land reptiles. So a lot of people confuse reptiles, uh, dinosaurs, and think it's the flying ones, the swimming ones. Technically, these are just the land ones, the land extinct reptiles, which we all are fascinated with. All right, mammoth. So this is a large extinct relative of the elephant, which is pretty obvious when you look at a picture of it. They got those big, long, curved tusks, tusks, and these guys were grazers, and that's an important clue. A grazer means that they're munching along the grass on the ground. And it's kind of funny because often we see, uh, you know, movies like Ice Age, right? And we see big old Manny, and he's, you know, walking around in, in ice and everything like that. And, you know, this is a fabrication from Hollywood. These guys lived in kind of normal grassy plains and they would chomp on their little grass. And uh, we're going to talk about what happened to them in a few minutes, but these guys were a little different from the next one, which is a mastodon. Mastodon is also an extinct relative of the elephant. These guys were a little smaller. And the big difference is that these guys were browsers. Browsers and grazers, different. Browsers, they love to grab the leaves off trees and bushes and shrubs and, and fruits and nuts and berries and that kind of stuff. Whereas the mammoths would just graze, grabbing the grass, you know, like cows and horses, they love to graze, they just munch on the grass. Whereas giraffes uh, prefer to browse, they grab the leaves off the trees. And like I said, a little smaller, the tusks were not so big, they didn't have that big giant curve, not as hairy as the, the mammoths. Not all the mammoths were super full of hair, but most of them, especially the ones that lived a little farther north, were hairier. All right, a crinoid is a marine creature. I showed you a stem of a crinoid. That was this little guy right here. And if you kind of see, I don't know if you can follow on my mouse, right here on the screen, see, you can see the stem there where the, the, the creature is connected to the coral. It's kind of funny too, because you look at crinoids and um, they look like plants. But like it says there, these are marine creatures, including starfish, sea urchins, and the sea lilies, um, and, and various other kinds. 
um, just because they don't have that traditional, you know, walk around on four legs or, or swimming with fins or whatever, doesn't mean they're not uh, animals. These guys are animals. They have a mouth and, and the whole thing. So crinoid, this is that group of marine creatures. And it's fun to see those little stems because they're very easy to find, by the way, these. Um, I live like 10 minutes away from Lake Michigan, and we can go to the lake there and find these little guys even there, which is kind of cool. A lingula is a kind of brachiopod marine creature, which has shells. And the strange feature about these guys is it has this stalk that it extends out. It's like a, a little arm that extends out. And you can see there in the picture, now brachiopod meaning that it has the shells, kind of like a regular brachiopod here that I showed you. This guy has the shells as well, but um, has that long stalk that it sticks out and it can grab stuff and stuff. So that's a lingula. Calamite, this is different now because it's a fossil that was made when this sediment and uh, all this sand and junk that uh, you know pressed up against it filled a hollow cavity or, or a stem of a plant. Now, everybody knows what a bamboo looks like and, and how they're hollow and they have those segments. So that's why I'm showing a picture of a bamboo here. The fossil was made because the inside was filled up. And that is a fossil when the inside is filled up. It's called a calamite. Calamite. All right. Foramen, or for the long word, is a foraminifera. So these guys are tiny little marine creatures. And they're shelled. And they, they, they don't have so much food to eat because they have to eat algae and bacteria, which is really, really tiny. Uh, but you can see these super zoomed in, super blowed up uh, pictures of foramens. And uh, they're kind of cool looking, but really, really, really tiny. We're, we're dealing with like plankton type size stuff. And these guys are also kind of in the same size category. Another tiny marine creature. This one's cool though, because it creates a mineral skeleton. Uh, you know, I mean, the shell is, is basically made of minerals and, and all these creatures they have, but these guys create this very bizarre skeleton. And um, again, also living on uh, algae and bacteria, but the, the, the designs are really, really cool uh, on these little creatures. I mean, nothing random about this. These are creatures that God created and he uh, included such awesome design. Um, and, and this is a tiny sampling. If you want to look at some really, really cool ones, uh, go check out, you know, Google on computer, or whatever, uh, radio larias. There's so many really, really cool designs for these guys as well. Paleozoic is a term that the honor asks us to learn. Now, this is a tricky, tricky section here because this is a name that evolutionary scientists give the earliest geologic era. And they believe that this era started 542 million years ago. Now, when you study the fossil record, the, the scientists that don't believe in creation, they see all the layers. That part is fine. We see that. Creationists see that. The problem is they believe that each one of those layers means the farther down you go, the older it is. So the layers way at the very, very bottom, the oldest layers, they believe it's the oldest layers that were laid out are the Paleozoic layers, 500 plus million years ago. And then millions of years passed and the next layers came and more millions of years passed and the next layers came. And you know they say that in each one of these layers or eras of time, they find different creatures. And in this layer, they find this. And then the higher up, we find this. And the higher up, we find that. And the higher up, we find this. They believe that this is a representation of evolution, meaning that uh, everything evolved over time all by itself and that there is no God and that there is no creator and that uh, at the very beginning, life forms were very, very simple. Uh, of course, if you actually study what's being found in a lot of these layers, like the Paleozoic, you'll find incredibly complex creatures, not simple creatures like People used to say, oh, we find, uh, you know, these little tripods in those, or uh, tripods, trilobites in those very low layers. So these are simple creatures. The problem is they're not simple creatures. They're incredibly complex creatures. They had a brain. They had multiple limbs and organs and very cool design to these guys. So just because you find them way down there does not mean that they're simple little one-celled creatures or something like that. No, all the way through, up and down, you find incredibly complex creatures 
the reason why we find so many creatures mixed up in these layers, if we look at the Bible, the Bible gives us a clue again about the flood. The flood buried everything. And the layers organized in different orders. Now, let's say we do a, 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 an experiment. We grab a bottle of water and we fill it with a bunch of different kinds of dirt and then we top it off with water. If you mix it up, you would think that you're just going to have this big muddy mess, right? But no. If you actually let it sit for a few minutes, the rock and stone layers will self-organize and you'll actually see the layers. It's really cool because that's how the layers are formed with lots of water. It's the only way. There's not like some big giant, you know, bulldozers that are creating all the layers on the world. No. Water sorted out all the different kinds of layers of sand in order and established them there that way. So it's kind of cool. The entire planet is in layers. And the only way to do that is with water, lots of water. So again, more clues of the biblical flood from Genesis. Now, we see all these creatures that are buried in, in these layers, and really all it's representing is these little creatures could not survive. These creatures were buried in this layer because of the makeup of the sand or whatever. It does not necessarily mean that there is some historical timeline there. All right, so um, one of the requirements that you guys have is, uh, number three, is that you have to visit a fossil bed and collect specimens, or you can visit a museum where fossils are on display. Now, clearly this is gonna be a, a little bit of a problem because you can't leave your house. We're not gonna go to a museum. We're not gonna go as a group to a fossil bed. After doing that, your requirement is to make an oral or written report, which um, that you can do, but you have to go to this, do this other thing first. So I thought instead we could do something fun. I actually have been on several digs, and a few years ago we were recording a video series, which maybe some of you guys have heard of, called The Creation Case, and we got to visit a dinosaur dig site. It was very cool, and I'm gonna show you now a little video clip of my time at the dig site. So it'll kind of be like visiting a fossil bed collecting specimens. So sit tight for a few minutes and I will show you the video. We are in Eastern Wyoming, not too far from South Dakota. The place that we're going to be digging is about a mile from here, and we have to go on foot. Come on. In the past, scientists working here say they've uncovered... Richard, um, uh, we lost the sound here, uh, so maybe uh, if you are able to just take us through you can play the video if the sound comes back i'll let you know but if not just tell us what's going on here there's dinosaur fossils just laying around on the ground yes many scientists report that they find these dinosaur bones and that they're 60 100 even 200 million years old did they really live that long ago did you know that a few years ago a scientist in montana found some fossils of T-Rexes that is causing a stir in the scientific community. In one of its leg bones, they discovered soft, unfossilized blood vessels, blood cells, and soft tissues. Scientists are coming forward now and saying that it's impossible that a dinosaur could remain unfossilized for 70 million years. They say it shouldn't even last a couple thousand years without becoming fossilized. Actually, I have a picture of that here on my phone. Check this out. Soft tissues from a T-Rex? That's incredible. Scientists examining it even talk about the awful stench of decay. Sadly, many scientists are still hanging on to the belief that dinosaurs lived millions of years ago. Instead of studying the possibilities that, hey, maybe they did live more recently, scientists are now working harder to try to figure out how to explain how soft tissue could have survived for 70 million years without being fossilized. 
In the meantime, more and more examples of soft tissues are being found in dinosaur fossils. We're going to do a little digging today. I hope we find some fossils. As always, safety is very important. Using the right tools also helps us to be careful around the fossils. Hey, check out this fossil I'm working on. This is from an Edmontosaurus. This is the hip bone. We need to excavate really carefully around it so we don't damage it. It's fun to learn about dinosaurs, but we'll never know everything. We don't even know what they look like, if they had fur or what color they were. One neat piece of evidence about this site here in Wyoming is the graded beds. One of evolution's theories is that dinosaurs died in small local floods, or that they got swept away by a river, but that they just died one at a time. But the evidence here proves that a large catastrophic event killed the animals first and then deposited them to this location. Scientists know that because the fossils that we find here have been sorted. That's why we find large fossils on the bottom, the medium ones higher up, and on the top we find the smallest ones. That's called a graded bed. The only way that they could be sorted this way is by being all brought here by one huge flood. Hmm. Genesis vividly describes the account of a giant global flood. Does the Bible talk about dinosaurs? Well, it doesn't use the word dinosaurs because it's a pretty new word. But it does talk about dragons, and it mentions them over 30 times. And it describes them as these big, mean animals that lived at that time. Were these real animals? No one knows what those animals really were. Verses in the Bible talk about the place where dragons live, or about slaying the dragons in the sea, or about being swallowed up by a dragon. Were these dragons in the Bible dinosaurs? I don't know. Many scholars think those verses were more poetic and metaphorical, but again, no one knows for sure. The book of Isaiah writes about fiery flying serpents in Egypt just like the ones Herodotus wrote about. The book of Job describes an animal called the behemoth, a huge animal with a humongous tail. The book of Job also describes an animal called the Leviathan, a huge scaly sea monster, and everybody was terrified of it. And that's not all. The creature, Leviathan, is also mentioned in the books of Psalms and Isaiah. Again, no one knows for sure what these animals are that are being described in the Bible. Some think they may be jackals or hippos or crocodiles, but some of the descriptions don't fit any animals that are alive today. It's a bit of a mystery. Come on, let's go check out other parts of the quarry. So what happened to all the dinosaurs? We know from all the dinosaur fossils that we find that many were buried in some sort of water-related catastrophe. They all got buried rapidly and preserved underground. Otherwise, if they're left on the surface, they're not going to last very long. They're going to decay or scavengers are going to get them. All over the planet, on every continent, there are billions and billions of creatures that have been buried by some water-related catastrophe mammals, birds, reptiles, fish, insects, and yes, even dinosaurs. With evidence of billions and billions of creatures buried by water and mud all over our planet, you would think it would be just easy enough to say everything got buried by water and mud on our planet. But evolution cannot agree to that, because that would mean there was a global flood. A global flood means the Bible is true. And if the Bible is true, that means God created the world. It's really sad to think that some people are missing out on the Bible truths that tell us where we came from. The Bible says that God destroyed the world with a huge global flood. A handful of animals were saved, but the rest of the animals on the planet were destroyed. 
they were buried by the flood waters. If we compare the things that the Bible says to the things that we see on this planet, they go together quite neatly. All right. So let's talk a little bit now about the proper removal of fossils because it's possible that you might someday, you know, you're walking around places that are very um, common for finding fossils, like a riverbed or the side of a mountain or something like that. You might come across a fossil and, uh, you know, how do you do that? What do you do with it? So it's important that you have the right tools. You saw in the video that um, I was using um, a brush, I was using a screwdriver because at that point I was doing more fine scaled uh, excavation. So I was using smaller tools, but in the earlier stages, you might use something like a mallet and a chisel, especially if you're working around a matrix that's already turned hard into a rock. Now, where I was working there in Wyoming, the matrix around it was actually pretty soft still. So the little screwdriver and a little light hammer was actually helping us to, to clear the matrix around. So that is not going to be the case. Often you're going to be working in actual solid rock, trying to get uh, the fossil out. A uh, sieve is also used to separate the smaller fossils from sand and gravels. And, and this is basically like a screen that is created into a box and then you just shovel whatever it is that you have in there and then you just shake it, shake it, shake it, shake it. Um, and all the smaller particles of sand and stuff like that uh, are falling underneath into a pile. I went on another excavation once in Jordan in the Middle East and this was an archaeology excavation. So we were actually digging at a site where people used to live and uh, where buildings used to be and stuff like that. So we were looking for any tiny little objects that we were, we were worried we were going to miss, you know, like a little a ring, you know, like a seal or, or any kind of other little trinkets or stuff like that. So we always had a sieve nearby and everything that we pulled out of the pit went into that screen and, and somebody would be shaking it all the time to make sure that we didn't miss any tiny little things. Same thing here with the um, fossils. We want to make sure that we don't miss anything small. We also use water to wash away smaller particles of the matrix that are surrounding the fossil. And water does amazing tricks because um, it'll wash away the, the sand and the dirt as well. The screen and the sieve works great. This is another great tool that we can use to wash away water because sometimes the water, the mud, the rock that is caked around a fossil will dissolve when water goes up against it. So water is also another important tool that we can use for proper removal of the fossil. Now, larger fossils, you have to be careful with. Larger fossils should be cast in plaster before you move them. And when we were on that dig over there, that one that I was pulling out, after we fully exposed it, we had to bring in our big buckets of plaster, mix the plaster, and we would cover it completely before we could move it because these are incredibly delicate. So it's very important too because you'll find a very big and important fossil. You can't just grab it out of the ground. You have to properly excavate around it first, and then if you can see that it's crumbly, that it's gonna decompose and just fall apart, you need to put it in plaster first. Then you can move it to the laboratory and, and they'll remove the plaster there and can work with it and study it and do whatever it is that they do. Now, it's not impossible that you might be cruising around and you might actually find a fossil and it might be a valuable fossil. This is of historical and scientific importance, so we don't want to just smash it and just yank it out and, and whatever. So if you ever come across a fossil, uh, the recommendation is that you do not try to remove it yourself. You need to contact a professional. Um, can't be too hard to find. You can ask one of your parents. You can ask a teacher. You can ask a scientist, somebody from a local museum, and they will help you make sure that it is a valuable fossil and, and they'll come in and properly excavate it. So the next part of our um, study here is about the contrast between evolution and creationists. The interesting thing about both of these people and these groups, you know, and, and we've kind of talked about it a little bit, evolutionists basically believe that there is no God, that everything evolved over millions and millions of years, slow little changes. 
Um, but the creationists, of course, live and believe that there is a God, a creator, and that this all happened at creation week and that this was recently. Both of these groups, when they see the fossils, it's not like one doesn't see it and the other does. I mean, we all see the fossils. We all believe, both groups, that they were formed, and the only way to happen is that they were formed quickly and buried in sediment. We talked about this a few minutes ago. So that part, nobody seems to disagree on, have a problem with. If you want to create a fossil, this is the only way to do it. The creature had to be quickly buried by sediment, which of course re represents a lot of water. And interestingly, people that uh, believe in evolution, they believe in massive amounts of water had to have done all this damage. The problem is, since they don't believe in the Bible, they will not go to the extent of saying that this was a global event like the Bible does, says, that this was one event. They'll just say there was a flood in Alberta, there was a flood in England, there was a flood in Argentina, there was a flood in Russia, there was a flood in China. There, the entire planet at one point or another had a flood, caused all these fossils, but they will not say that it's one event because then they're basically saying the Bible story is true. They don't want to go there. But it's interesting because that part we agree on. The part we don't agree on is about how long ago this happened. The when did these creatures and, and objects become fossilized? They believe that it was millions of years ago, right? The evolutionists think that most of these fossils form millions and millions, and they put these dates on them. When you go to the museum, you've probably seen the little tags. This little fossil is 180 million years old, and this one is 500 million years old, and the T-Rexes are 65 million years old. And Creationists believe that they're uh, evolutionists, like I said, believe that there is no God and that everything evolved by itself over millions and millions of years. So big difference versus what creationists believe, that God created everything, just as it says in the Bible, it happened during creation week, six literal days, and that this all happened, the fossilizing part happened during Noah's flood, which we believe, you know, depending on how people measure the timeline, some people believe the, the creation would have been 6,000 years ago, 8,000 years ago. So generally speaking, it's people just say less than 10,000 years ago. And these people time the flood to be somewhere in that four to 5,000 years ago. So we believe that most of these fossils happened at the time of the flood, and that this was sometime around four or 5,000 years ago, and that they all happened at once, one event. Now, the next part of uh, the honor that we're looking at here talks about the Ice Age. And, um, you know, I, I put this funny little picture of, of Manny and all those guys from the, the movies that you're probably familiar with. We see these movies and we laugh and we enjoy them. We see these creatures walking around on ice and think that it was just this endless field of ice and um, not quite true. The important thing to, to bring out as well is the timing the timing of the ice age would have been put after the flood because the ice at one point did cover believed to be and again both creationists and evolutionists about a third of the world and there are scientific models that show why this would have happened because remember the flood the waters came from two places it came from the, the sky but most of it came from under the ground the waters under the ground erupted which means we're talking about hot water hot water would evaporate and create snowstorms because the atmosphere would have been cold. Um, again, we can cover all that in a different uh, honor, but it is believed that for hundreds of years after the flood, the, the climate would have gotten a lot colder and the ice would have gone farther and down, farther down from the poles and farther down, sometimes moving quicker, sometimes moving slower, but generally speaking, moving down. So the Ice Age, the mammoths, all these guys, when all these guys would have lived is after the flood. Because when we see the permafrost, that's the frozen ground, the layers are already established. So this did not happen before the flood, the freezing of the ground, the layers were frozen. So we know this is after the flood. And how do we explain the frozen animals that we find in these areas? Um, you know, like I said earlier, popular culture makes it sound like, you know, um, and you've probably seen movies and shows that all of a sudden this incredibly fast freeze came and push, and everything was like frozen in place and, and you couldn't move and all these creatures and everything. 
that's popular culture and we have to be careful not to always just believe everything we hear in movies and popular culture because science actually disagrees. Uh, when we look at what we find, there are very, very, very few frozen carcasses that are found. That is by far the least thing they find. Most of these mammoths, creatures and stuff that we find are extremely decomposed. That means they're rotting for some time, which requires time in order to rot. And flesh decomposes a lot quicker than bone, but you know we're, we're not finding these creatures just frozen standing around. So the Ice Age, even though you may hear a lot of that, it was not a very quick event. And here are a couple of quick to, uh, tips to understand why we know that. First of all, when flesh is rotting, it requires a lot of time. So we're seeing and, and uncovering these creatures frozen and their flesh has already decomposed, which means a lot of time happened before. It's not like they froze like that. It wasn't quick. We also know that uh, most of these cases where we find these things, it's mostly bone, which like I said, decomposes a lot slower with little pieces of flesh attached to them. Again, this is contrary to the idea of having something quick happen. We also find uh, in those few places that we find like fleshy stuff, we find the evidence of fly uh, putting their eggs or pupas in there and it's, you know, because they lay their eggs in the rotting flesh. So we're finding flies mixed in with the uh, flesh, which would not happen if everything is freezing and everything is instantly freezing. So that is another clue that's actually the opposite. So it's showing us that these creatures died during the summer uh, time. We also know that with the finds that the carcasses that we're finding were scavenged, meaning it died, other creatures came along and had a lunch and chowed down on it. And what about these other creatures? Didn't they get frozen? I mean, if this all happened quickly as some sort of freeze, how come these creatures didn't freeze? So we know that it was a slow rot because the animals died, they're sitting out rotting, other animals are coming in and having a snack and keep on going. So the scientists that also look at this in detail have established that most of these died during non-winter seasons, which is completely opposite of what everybody hears. Because we're flying, finding plants and tender flowers and the flies you know, in their stomachs, in their flesh, which again would be impossible if everything was in the winter, everything was freezing cold. The interesting thing, by the way, in places like Siberia, the only thing we find up there uh, frozen in the permafrost are mammoths. Now, we know that lots of other creatures lived up there, but we don't find them in the frozen in the permafrost. And it's believed this because all those other creatures were fast moving and were able to move and migrate quick enough while the climate changed. You know, we don't know exactly how fast it changed. It wasn't like that, but we do know that it was uh, reasonably quick. These guys got trapped up there. Elephants, as you know, migrate extremely slowly, so they would, were not able to make a quick getaway uh, south to where it might have been warmer. And um, we're getting here close to the end of what we are needing to cover. The Bible and the Spirit of Prophecy, books written by Ellen G. White, help us understand a little bit of extra background. Now, words like coal and petroleum and fossils and limestone and dinosaurs and all these things, we don't find these words directly mentioned in the Bible. But we find evidence that shows us how they were formed in the Bible. And the very cool thing is that the, uh, there's several passages in the Spirit of Prophecy that help us understand about these. And I remember the first time I read these a couple of years ago, I was like, wow. And it's very graphic, and I'm going to let you guys take a, a look at it and read it now. I'll, I'll read it for us. But um, Patriarchs and Prophets says, The entire surface of the earth was changed at the flood. Everywhere were strewn the dead bodies of men and beasts. Now, it's kind of gross. The Lord would not permit these to remain, to decompose, and pollute the air. Therefore, he made of the earth a vast burial ground. Of course, we're talking about fossils, because that's what it is. A violent wind, which caused to blow for the purpose of drying up the waters, moved them. We're talking about the remains, the beasts and the animals and the humans that were dead. Moved them with great force. In some instances, even carrying away the tops of mountains 
and heaping up trees and rocks and earth above the bodies of the dead. Wow, that is such an incredibly descriptive passage. It, it just amazes me what God had to do because, you know, these people are getting off the boat and there's just dead everything laying around. That would be unhealthy, of course, disgusting, disturbing. It's interesting, too. Another passage says, at this time, immense forests were buried. And these have since been changed to coal. Remember earlier I said that coal is actually trees and forests and wood, forming the extensive coal beds that now exists and also yielding large quantities of oil. Also, oil comes from biomass, living things, algae, bark, trees, leaves, whatever, that has been converted into fossil fuels or fossil like the coal itself. So I, I don't know about you guys, but I find it incredibly fascinating that we get these little clues about what happened specifically with these items like coal, petroleum, fossils, or the limestone. All right. Whew, we have made it yes, to the have. end. <laughs> yes, <laughs> babe. Awesome. Thank you, Richard, for this. Uh, a few questions came in and a few people... Uh, uh, but I, I figured I wasn't going to be able to get there unless uh, we uh, kind of blew through this. So. No, no, that's fine. That's fine. Uh, uh, so, Richard, just uh, to help everybody summarize, uh, when it comes to completing this on, um, uh, they, they, there are some parts they might not be able to do at the moment, as you mentioned. Uh, so which part they can't do it just for them to have in their mind? And then we're going to go to a few questions. Yeah, yep. So the honor, of course, if you check out the webpage um, that you guys provided has the requirements. Pretty much the, the trickier ones here is uh, the making a collection of fossils because it, it is required to make a collection of 10 fossils, but you're not going to be able to go out and do that quite yet. We did look at them, right? We studied them, even though it's not a collection. And the other thing was to create that oral or written report. Um, other than that, really, I think we covered everything that we need to cover. Uh, somebody asked a, a quite interesting question. Uh, um... If you come across a fossil, uh, who do you contact? A police, Sabbath school teacher, Dan Stokovic, or professional? What is a professional? <laughs> so we definitely want to contact a professional, a scientist, a professor, somebody from a museum. And definitely don't bother your uh, leaders uh, when you find a fossil. <laughs> That's why right. uh, I would not be able to help. I can tell you that for sure. Um, uh, somebody did mention that, uh, that there is uh, something missing on, I think, on the page four of the worksheet. Uh, so uh, so don't, don't worry about that, Richard. We're going to just repost again that uh, worksheet if there is any problems with that. So that the guys, nothing to worry. Once again, Richard, big thank you for your presentation. Uh, we're going to stop here. Uh, we're going to uh, also go into the gallery mode so we can see people's faces. Let's give a big clap to uh, Richard, uh, uh, Richie as he, uh, uh, for the presentation. So, so let's, I'm going to just mute here once again. Richard, big thank you for this. If anybody did miss anything, uh, there will be a PowerPoint and a worksheet uh, uh, on our web page. And uh, we want to also encourage everybody who's watching this. There is a Sabbath school, uh, which uh, Richard works every single, uh, for every single Saturday. Give us a little bit more information about that, Richard. Yeah, so I know that uh, a lot of the, the people can't go to church, obviously, and are wondering what to do for Sabbath school. So uh, about a month ago, I started producing a weekly uh, review of the primary Sabbath school lesson, and I post that on uh, my YouTube channel, which is Rich Ag If you just go to YouTube and search for Rich Aguilera, you'll see it there, or on my Facebook page, Rich Aguilera, and our ministry name is called One Mustard Seed. Um, and I created an actual... Um, do I have a copy of it here? A study guide that goes with it. So it's games and puzzles that, that teach about the lesson as well. And you can download that as well from uh, one of my uh, web pages, which is uniquechristiantoys.com forward slash free stuff. I know that the link has been shared around on some of those signs there too. So it's really easy to find. So if you just kind of do a little search for my name and primary Sabbath school, you will definitely see it a uh, video that I produce every week. Excellent. Uh, Richard, uh, just before we close, uh, uh, somebody did ask, would the pictures of fossil be acceptable for those who cannot collect or, or have to be uh, 
Yeah, it's, it's a great question. And under the current conditions that we are in, I would say that some flexibility is understandable and would be required. So I would say yes. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, a big thank you uh, for this presentation. We're hoping to have you sometimes again, but God's grace, we will. Uh, thank you so much for amazing work. And to everybody who watched and joined us, uh, thank you so much for taking time. Some of you spent three hours with us today. You did not a medal. Uh, um, uh, for those who just joined us for the chocolates, uh, shame on you because you only want to eat sweet stuff. I'm just joking, guys. I, we, we love to have you with us. And, and, and thank you so much for fossils because it is part of the beautiful uh, honors that we're not always are able to have. And, and this way we will be able to uh, teach it all, over and over again. So everybody, God bless you. I'm going to... Uh, uh, I'm going to stop the live feed uh, uh, on, 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 on Facebook and see you next Saturday for Adventures and next Sunday for the Part Funders. We have some exciting people and some exciting honors coming up. God bless you and see you soon. And we're going to unmute now. Everybody. 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 Everybody.